we are discussing uh, a million a million days um which is screening at fright fest now you were at fright fest a couple of years ago with the show and now you're back with a million days how, how are you feeling about that um I'm, you know what I'm, I'm i'm really looking forward to it we were there in a few years prior to that with show pieces which was the collection yeah. of short films that alan and i did together we did the anthology um so this will be my third Fright Fest. So I'm 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 really looking forward to it. I mean, it's a it's always a blast there because you know the 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 film goers are you know they're smart people. You know anyone who goes and does the horror and the sci-fi, you know they are one of the smartest kind of fan groups or audiences you can have, shall we say? So no, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And I don't think like the two projects could be more different from one another. What was, <laughs> what was it about, you know, given that you had made the show in the past, what was it about the, the script for, for A Million Days that, that made you excited to get involved with? Um, well, I came in late to the project, to be perfectly honest. Um, but when I read it, there was just a really good story there. Um, and, and I just liked, I liked the story. I just thought, you know, the fact that someone has to make this huge decision over the course of one evening, that you know their life's work and everything that they have ever thought was this is the way forward for you know us as a human species and everything is put onto tipped over onto the other end um, and and I just thought it it could be an interesting take on things and then when we actually got it cast um, and I got Kemi Bo Jacobs who plays Sam um, and you know up against Simon. Um, I was really excited, and when I, when we got into the room, because we didn't have long for um, pre pre production, mm -hmm. and I only had them for a couple of days before we started shooting. We got them in the room with Hermione, and it was I knew that there's you know there was something there, so uh, it was just an exciting project to take on. And also I, the previous one film I'd made that still isn't out for various bloody reasons. Um, was a uh, period drama, lavish, multi-million pound period drama set in Mauritius, shot over the COVID um, right. period. Um, so none of the projects I've taken on are, are in any way remotely similar. And I kind of, I like that. I, I just think just doing something new and different every time. And every film comes with a challenge and, you know, highbrow, high concept, you know, low budget sci-fi certainly comes with its own problems but you know it's it's an interesting genre and something I want to explore. Yeah because I think there is as a director there is that creative freedom more than in in some other jobs to constantly reinvent yourself and do something different so it, it is always to me a little bit disappointing when a director comes back with a film that's basically the film that they just made but maybe it's set somewhere slightly different so I think it's always it's always exciting to see a director that's not afraid to go in a completely different uh, direction from what auditors will know them for. No, no, and, and I mean, I've got, literally, I've got, I've got two others now bubbling away very nicely. Um, and again, both of them are so radically different from each other and indeed what I've done. And I just, the idea of just keep challenging yourself and just taking new opportunities, new creative approaches um, is kind of, yeah, you know, that's, that's the exciting thing. That's what gets you out of bed. You know, just, like you say, just, doing the same thing again and again. It's just like, oh, okay. It's a nice way to make money, I suppose. But if you want to actually express yourself as an artist, then I think you've got to make, you know, you, you've got to challenge yourself. I think when people hear science fiction, their minds go racing off in all variety of directions, especially when it comes to technology. And this film is set in like 2041, so it's not it's not too far in the future. How did you, you know, decide how far to push the technology? Because you know, I've seen I've seen films recently which aren't, you know, too dissimilar a time period ahead. And there's all sorts of magical, fantastical flying things and whatnot. You know, how important was it for you to, you know, make sure that the technology was grounded still in some way? Um, well, I think there's various um there's various reasons for making these decisions. I think one of them being as a director, you've got to be, and I, and I kept saying this to the producers and to everyone else, it's like, guys, what do you do? You give me a number, we have to back into that number, you know, production wise. Um, so for me, I thought, you know, I, I would have had less VFX in the film. 
ultimately. I think it's a three-hander. It's a concept piece. Um, so, and I think unless you can really, unless you can really, really have the budget to do the VFX super, super brilliant and all the gadgets and everything, it strikes me, because audiences are sophisticated, they are so used to seeing the Star Wars and seeing the Marvel films and they're seeing all of this with VFX budgets that are off the Richter scale, how can we compete? And, and, and we can't. Um, but I also like the idea when I read it, um, when I read the original screenplay, it was like, I wanted Anderson to be this anachronistic kind of guy. I wanted him grounded in things from the past. So he, ha I wanted that. Um, and it just, it just seemed, A, it would work for budgetary reasons, and that's always a very important thing as a director. You do need to be mindful of what you've got and what you can achieve um, and spend your money and your time in the right place. But for me, I thought that gave him as a character just more grounding, you know, if he's if he was wandering around with all these gizmos and everything, you know, slightly cheesy, is it needed for the story? The story is about the decision he has to make over the course of that evening. It isn't about everything else around him. Um, so that was my thinking on it. Yeah, I think it would think it sound well. I think it there's enough science fiction elements in the in the story itself that it doesn't need some like you say some like little gizmo to be like oh look we're in the future now uh so yeah definitely i definitely think that that, that was a, a sound decision and obviously that the, the main point of, of technology in the film is this ai j that's been created that's the the crux of the the whole the story whole yeah you know and obviously ai is something that's very much in everyone's mind at the moment you know that with within the the entertainment industry but also uh, you know for, for wider society what do you envisage that our future use of AI might be? Because I think this film, although it's fiction, I think there is some horrifying elements that, you know, could one day be true. Um, no, no, I I think you're right. I, I do. And I'm... So when we made the film um, a year ago, AI wasn't to the point that it is now. It's now just it's as if the genie has just come out, yeah. you know, it's like, bam. So, you know, it was always there in the background. We knew all these AIs were there, you know, when you answer a telephone or you're on Spotify or you're doing all of these things. But all of a sudden, I mean, I, I come from a photographic background, but I've just, you know, just starting to see the stuff that people are creating just through prompts, you know. It, it's just, it's, it's kind of insane, and it has happened so fast. Um, it is terrifying because I think what we were getting at with the film, really, we're saying 2041. I mean, wow, I think that's going to be happening much quicker than 2041. To be perfectly honest with you, I mean, you know, the stuff that the armies and everyone else are doing with the robotic bloody soldiers and everything, it's it's changing so fast. And, and I, think, I think we were being... Um, optimistic in saying 2041 i think you know 2031 you know things like this are going to be happening you know decisions will be being made by um by um ai and that will be impacting on us i mean the very fact that the european union now are investing time and money already starting to put in place um laws and regulations to stop ai actually developing at such a pace without any kind of guidance Thankfully, someone's being mindful and doing that, but it's going to happen. I mean, the fact that people are, you know, Disney and all these other people, they, they want to just employ or just get AI to write screenplays for them. You know, oh, these are what's worked in the past. Here are the formulaic prompts and things that work. Off we go. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, it, it, it's terrifying. I mean, you can see that you can see the Terminator and the skeleton behind me. Yeah. Something I take very seriously is, you know, that one day that you know the AIs are going to be our overlords. So yeah, it is. It's terrifying, and I guess I guess we've only got a few years left to enjoy it by, by your calculations. Well, I don't think we've got until twenty forty one to be perfectly honest without something happening. I mean, because it really is that we are giving over so much to them already, just to do in our everyday life everything you listen to and what you watch on tv it's someone 
the AI algorithm is deciding what we watch, buy, and enjoy, or what we think we should enjoy. Same with the news feed. You know, you click on your news feed, you know, what you like, that's the news feed you're going to get. So, no, I think we were being very optimistic in thinking that 2041, and certainly with the um, ecosystem that's happening at the moment, look at what's happening in Hawaii. Yeah. This is it's happening much quicker than we anticipated when we had the screenplay. Yeah, it's it's all terrifying. Uh, yes, yeah, so my final my final question uh, before I let you get back to your your weekend. Um, this is on first thing on on the Friday at Fright Fest. Pass holders are going to be in the process of working out what they're watching. Why should they take a chance on on a million days? Why should they take a chance on a million days? I don't know because I work really really hard. <laughs> it's my third film. And please come. No, I think I think. Uh, you know, it's a simple film. It, it, you know, it's not bells and whistles. It's a thoughtful film, and um, and I think the sophisticated audience um, that Fright Fest attracts, I think, for them, is something for them to be thinking about. And I do think it's now. I think the subject matter and our approach to it in a very simple, high concept kind of way is all about what's happening in the world at this minute. I think it's very relevant. And equally, I do think we have a very sophisticated audience. And I think the film, you know, it's not going to be shoot them up, but it is something to go away and it's going to stimulate you. And, you know, and it's one o'clock in the afternoon. It's a good time to go and do the thought stuff. Go and think about it. Be inspired or frightened even just for the bloody what, what the film's about. Um, but yeah. Come and see it. Well, I wish you best of luck with the screening. Thank you so much. Take care.